We're going live. Yay. Yay. Here we are. We are on we are live on Facebook in ecstatically alive with the Aaron Nichols. <laughs> and this guy is a writer, educator, and entrepreneur who envisions a world in which every human being is intimately familiar with the power that lives inside of them and a world in which the sexual polarity is honored and enjoyed. I love it. <laughs> and um, Aaron also happens to be one of my best friends. We've been through many different chapters together and I can truly attest that he is someone who walks his talk. I do my best, thanks. <laughs> hmm. So Aaron, tell us, um, today you are speaking on sexual self-love and can you just tell us how you came up with that topic? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I've been investigating and practicing, exploring, researching, studying um, sexuality and psychology and metaphysics for a long, long time. And, and intimacy. And I, I mean, by, by that, both physical and emotional intimacy. And to me, it seems like relating, whether it's sexual or just, you know, through emotional intimacy, any kind of connection, really starts with our relationship with ourselves and particularly around sexuality and sexual pleasure. You know, there's so much conditioning and shaming and it's very confusing for most of us, you know, and we, I think very few of us have really uh, a totally whole and healthy relationship with our sexuality. And I, I mean, I'm still working on it myself, um, but this is a way that we can experience the, the innocence of pleasure and the innocence of our sexuality without any of that other conditioning, without other people's, you know, you know, when we're connecting with someone else, as wonderful as that can be, often, you know, especially with a new person, there's their anxieties and all kinds of emotional complexities and things that are happening that we can be very much in our heads and sort of in performance mode. Um, am I doing it right? Do they like it? Uh, does my body look okay? You know, all of these things that you know, when we're alone with ourselves, we may, we may notice those things, but they're not um, <laughs> so amplified. And so it's actually, it's a good way to get in touch with just the simple pleasure that emerges from our bodies. And also just notice all of those, you know, subtleties of emotion and energy and, you know, our thoughts and beliefs that come up because fundamentally it's a, it's a meditative practice. And it's okay if you don't have experience with meditation, because this is, some people, you know, a lot of what we, we know about meditation is just sort of like quiet the mind and, you know, be with your breath and that's all great and valuable. And for some people, I think somatic meditation is, is uh, much more accessible. And so that's what, that's personally what I've done the most of myself. And there's so much in the body, so much richness in there. And also the emotions are in there. So there's so much to get in touch with there. But this to me is like the most fabulous somatic meditation because it's focused on pleasure. So it's, it's fun, it's enjoyable. And you know, we get to really experience all the richness of pleasure that actually lives inside of us. And I think that that's also one of the, the really wonderful teaching aspects of this practice is that you know, we tend to, be, to believe that pleasure is somewhere outside of ourselves, something that we can get, you know, whether it's through uh, you know, entertainment or substances or, you know, sex with another person. And, you know, that's all okay. But fundamentally, I think that pleasure is actually emerging from us. And also love, you know, love, we're, we're seeking to get love from other people and to be loved for what we do, you know, and, and how people see us and all of that. But this is a way where we can actually, you know, directly experience love, our own love, without anybody else's input or judgments or, um, you know, any dependency on anything outside of ourselves. 
So this is a practice of making love to yourself. Exactly. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, it's, it's making love to oneself. And so, you know, that also, so it's also a great teaching tool for sex with others because, you know, again, there's so much conditioning around sex and there's all the performance stuff and, um, you know, and of course there's just fucking like raw fucking and, you know, like that's okay. I love it too. You know, but there's so much subtlety. There's a huge range of things that we can experience sexually. And I think that in our culture, really, especially with the way that porn has influenced us, um, and there's so much of a, you know, uh, sort of aggressive go-getting, you know, value in our culture that we've really lost access to, I think a lot of us, the, the real, you know, just the subtle beauties of connection and touch and just going slowly, sensuality. And so, you know, this is a sexual practice, certainly, but I would say it's probably even more sensual. And, you know, there, there's kind of a, a big gray area there. It's, it can be hard to define those two things or separate them from each other. But the encouragement I want to give is that going into this practice, you don't have to go into, you know, we, we tend to associate sex with orgasm, you know, that high, high state of pleasure, that sort of ex explosive experience of pleasure. And that's fine, that can be part of it, but there's a huge range of pleasure, pleasurable sensations that may be more in the sensual realm where it doesn't have to go into that you know, intensity. Mm. I wanted to just hone in on one little thing that you said, which was about how porn has influenced our society. And just, I wanna really note that right mm. here is how much porn we're not really talking about how much porn is influencing our society on a massive level. Our sexuality, as well as our relationships, everything. It's, it's pretty intense. And um, how much porn is keeping people, their entire sexuality is in their head. It's like, and then they're unable to, like pleasure becomes something that's just about watching like looking at something rather than an embodied experience. Indeed, indeed, yeah. And it's like, it's this kind of strange thing where, well, interestingly, it's like, so there's that sexual pleasure that we're going for, getting off, getting to the orgasm, right? Which is, I think, how a lot of people use porn. It's just that stimulation to get to that thing. But then it's also this mental thing. And so there's this mental experience happening. And again, it's sort of this externalization that, I was talking about. So there's the mental and then there's that gross physical experience, but what's happening in here, you know, between the head and the genitals? What about the rest of the body? What about the heart? Yeah, there's so no heart in porn. I mean, it's super rare to find porn with any heart and that's where the love making is, you know? And, and yeah. also the, you know, just the, the embodiment, the sensuality. And, and you know, when, when we're watching porn, the truth is too, it's mostly performance. It's not even real. <laughs> like the, you know, the pleasure we're seeing by and large is, if it even is genuine pleasure, it's very disconnected. And again, just that's very genitally focused. Um, so there's yeah. so much that porn just like leaves out of the picture. And, and it is a picture. It's a picture, it's not reality, you know? Yeah. And it takes us out of the reality of our own experience. And this is unfortunately how a lot of people are learning about sex, which is really so it's sad. So sad. It's so right sad. Right here to tell us about more about this lovemaking practice. So you called it sexual self-love. I want to call it uh, self-lovemaking. I love that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I think the um, it's all valid. And some people call this sort of practice, mindful masturbation. I don't like the word masturbation personally. No. Um, some call it mindful self-pleasuring, which I like more, but I do really wanna emphasize that self-love aspect because it is a way of directly giving oneself love. I love and, that. And as you said, love making, that's great too. I mean, I'm honestly not attached to what we call it. <laughs> that's just the, the phrase I came up with. Beautiful, but can you, so tell us about what the practice looks like. So what it looks like, um, the, one of, first of all, great thing about this practice is that you don't have to get it right. 
it's not like a strict regimented thing. You must do these things, you know, and if you don't do them right, you're going to fail. Um, I'd say there's really only one very important rule, which even this rule can be bent a little bit if you have to, if you really have, feel like you have to go there. But that one rule is no fantasy. And that's where I think this gets really interesting because different people have different relationships with fantasy. I think men tend to be more fantasy oriented, but certainly women fantasize too, whether, you know, when self-pleasuring or even with a partner, but the rule here is no fantasy. So what does that do? That means that you are focused on sensation and emotion and all of those, those subtleties, right? Um, so I'll just kind of walk you through what the practice looks like. First of all, again, this is a meditative practice and I think it really helps to bring intention to it and to create what I would call sacred space. And for those who are not so spiritually oriented, I just want to kind of redefine sacred so that it's not some sort of woo woo inaccessible thing. <laughs> well, hopefully it's more accessible this way. So sacred, what I'm referring to here is basically transformational space. And so there's this distinction between the profane, which is sort of the mundane world, just the sort of ordinary, you know, rote world that we're, we're used to experiencing going through the motions. Whereas when you come into sacred space, it's a place where things can transform, where you can get in touch with deeper realities. And so even if you, you know, you're just considering that the deeper realities of your, your body and your energy and your emotions, great. It doesn't have to be, you know, some further out there spiritual thing, though it can be. So we're creating this sacred space. And what's interesting about sacred space actually is it's very similar. There are similarities with what I would say are romantic space and sensual space. So you wanna create this intention to have this experience and you start doing that by you know, lighting some candles, uh, maybe essential oils that are really you know, sensually pleasing, music that's sensual. So you really, it's like you're making the space to make love, you know, like, like hopefully you would do with a partner sometimes at least <laughs> um and uh so that's kind of the first thing I, I also just want to step back a little bit and say that it is helpful to do some preparatory practice um to get into your body maybe stretching qigong yoga even just sitting and breathing doing some meditation to quiet yourself to get all of the you know the other things that have been happening in your mind and in the world just to kind of ease up on you and just be present with yourself. Yeah. So you do that, you create the space for it, and then you lie down naked, hopefully if the temperature is accommodating to that, but where you have access to your whole body and you're just there with yourself in that beautiful space. Mm -hmm. And then you simply just start exploring with your touch. You're not going directly to your genitals, super important. That's the last thing you're gonna go to. So you just explore your body with touch. You know, what does this feel like? Oh, okay, yeah, that's an interesting sensation. And, you know, how about here? And, you know, give yourself little kisses and be loving, loving, loving toward yourself like you would with someone else that you're making love to. Um, I also really strongly recommend actually using the words out loud, I love you. Just telling yourself, I love you. It's, it's a really, in my experience, a really beautiful and tender experience just to, to feel that from oneself and to, to verbalize it. So you explore everywhere, you know, and here's the thing too, don't be attached to like, everything has to feel amazing. You're exploring, you're just kind of meandering, you know, discovering. And I really, really strongly recommend touching every part of your body. Um, even if it's just a little bit, just to integrate all of the parts to bring the whole body into the experience and and experiment with different types of touch you know there's caressing oh look at your feet <laughs> that's another thing you're reminding me of playfulness it's great to have a playful attitude just like when you're when you're making love to someone else you don't want to be super serious you know doing it right i must do this right it's playful it's exploration you know you don't have to get it right so those are the two kind of attitude frames that I like to recommend are lovingness and playfulness. Just keep that attitude all throughout. All throughout your whole life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good recommendation. Um, one second. <clears throat> 
So you explore your body and, and you can kind of, you know, again, caressing fingernails, maybe little squeezes, experiment with those different types of touch. Um, it's a great way also to learn what your touch feels like when you touch someone else. Mm -hmm. And then see if you can just subtly ramp up the intensity a little bit without touching your genitals. So of course, you know, men's and women's bodies are more actually more similar than they're different, but they are different. And, but generally our erogenous zones are the same. Um, and really we could say the whole body is an erogenous zone just with some parts being more sensitive than others and it, it um, inducing more sexual stimulation. So go for those parts last. So generally for most people, um, the nipples are gonna be kind of right before the genitals, um, the, the general breast area. But also, you know, of course you notice that like ears can have a particular sort of sexual, heightened sexual sensation, you know, don't forget about your neck and, you know, just explore, but see if you can produce some sexual stimulation arousal without touching your genitals. Right. So this is, um, and, and again, don't be attached to like, especially for men, you know, there's so much anxiety around our erections and, and that's the other thing is that often our erections and heightened sexual stimulation are dependent on visual stimulus. So that can be a, a slight challenge for men here, but see what you can do. And as you get closer to the genitals, you may notice some sexual stimulation coming and then you can tease the genitals a little bit. You know, don't go straight for, okay, it's time. I'm gonna, you know, just hit it hard. No, no, no. <laughs> We're gonna ease into it, ease into it and just see how much sexual arousal you can produce without either direct or intense stimulation. Now it's up to you. Go ahead. I just wanted to talk about the teasing bit. Yeah. Everyone loves teasing. Like with a lover, I mean, people want to be teased, but we often don't tease ourselves. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, just, you know, with masturbation, I think often it's sort of a thing. It's like a, <clears throat> there's a sexual urge we want to satisfy, just kind of get it over with. Mm. This is not that, and I'm not saying don't ever do that. It's just, this is an intentional practice to explore everything and go into the depths, all the depths and subtleties that are not available with that just, okay, I'm going to get off. You can get off here, but that's not what this is about. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so you're, you explore your body, you go into you know more sexual, kind of start to move from sensual into more sexual stimulation. And then as you do stimulate your genitals, you can continue, you have two hands, you know, you can continue to touch yourself in other places as well. Um, you can use both hands on your genitals, whatever you want, you know, and explore every part of your body. Um, anus is, if, if, you know, it's a worthy thing to explore, um, everything, 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 right? Now, Again, you know, there's so much focus sexually, whether we're pleasuring ourselves or with someone else on orgasm, got, got, to, got to get to that orgasm. And I think one of the beautiful things that we can learn in this practice, and this is kind of coming from, a, in my understanding, it's, it's more, this is one of the things I've learned from, from the Chinese Taoist practices around orgasm and energy is that orgasm isn't just that peak. The way I look at it, all sexual arousal, even at the most subtle levels, <laughs> you feel the chest. I'm practicing, okay? I'm getting yeah. it. <laughs> and actually, you're reminding me of another really, really great um, point that, to, to bring up. But so all sexual arousal is orgasm. It just comes to a point ahead where it sort of can be explosive, but that's not the only kind of orgasm either because it can kind of come up to a high state and stay there and then come down and come back up. And you know there, there are lots of different types of orgasmic experiences. But the point here is that you can start to notice that as you become sexually aroused, you are actually in a state of orgasm. It's just that it has different levels. I, I like to say that the best orgasms happen, start to happen when we give up the idea of orgasm. Interesting, yeah. Orgasm, like this peak, like 
so much of what makes sex really bad in the world is this focus on that getting to that peak well, rather than realizing that every moment is an orgasm. Indeed. And actually, interestingly, um, you know, Wilhelm Reich, who is sort of a, a uh, scientist and luminary and multidisciplinary scientist that we're kind of not supposed to know about. Interestingly, he died in U.S. custody and, um, you know, had his laboratories and books burned. And, you know, he was really investigating orgasm quite a lot. He was very interested in it. And energy sort of biological energy in general and his perspective was that all pleasure basically is orgasm just in subtle ways like all physical pleasure and it's it's um energy sort of moving to the surface whereas when we're in, in sort of the opposite of pleasure we go into contraction and the energy comes in like this and so that the the orgasm is the expansion of the energy basically mm. it, through the body um yeah, so what you reminded me of with your movement is move, allow your body to move. And this, you know, there are some differences in the conditioning, but I also think probably some biological aspects to it too, of the ways that uh, more men and women, more masculine and feminine people experience these things. And, you know, women tend to be more in touch with their sensuality. And so a lot of this may be more immediately accessible to women, but super valuable for men too. And movement you know, allow your body to move, explore that as you're exploring the, you know, the touch and all the sensual nuances also allow your body to move. Another super, super important thing, and this is also related to orgasm and, and the, just the movement of that pleasure is the voice. Allow yourself to vocalize even, and, and just notice too, so I think a lot of people are actually, um, especially men, can be cut off from the vocalization of sensation, sexual pleasure, and can be kind of like mute, like I must be stoic, right? <laughs> but, but just notice like, you know, if you, if you take a bite of food that is delicious, it's exquisitely delicious, your body just automatically goes, mm, right? It's just a, it's a natural expression of pleasure that just comes out. Your body will do the same thing with sensual and sexual pleasure if you allow it to. So I really encourage you to let that happen because that also allows the pleasure to move through your body. And as the intensity picks up, as you experience higher states of pleasure and orgasm, then those vocalizations may be more intense. Another thing you know that we vocalize naturally is emotion. And so that's another... Um, realm of experience that's that's integral to this that we can be tuned into and allow to move and vocalize as well um i have to say that you know i mean i've done a lot of work around emotions my own emotions and just sort of like un unclogging myself in that way um over the years and so you know i have no aversion to crying uh personally i i, I but this, like, it's, it's rare that I cry in gratitude, like, like such intense, and you such an intense experience of gratitude. Tears? Are tears, you're supposed to collect them because they're this, like, uh, the most powerful elixir. If wow. you can actually get genuine gratitude tears, they're, they're made of, like, something very powerful. So maybe wow. you can get your gratitude tears and then put them on your and use them as some like lube. <laughs> nice. <laughs> lube, that's another important thing to mention here. Um, but yeah, or, you know, maybe just get them into your back into one of your orifices. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, really like I've experienced such intense gratitude during this practice that I've actually wept. Um, which to me, even I was like, what? <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Because it's that fucking beautiful, or it can be, you know, if you really allow yourself to surrender. Is. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, and just to that point too, it's, it's, um, you know, there are a lot of, there's so many benefits to this practice and so many layers and levels that we can access through it. But one of the great things is that it actually is a great way to teach us, as we mentioned before, you know, more about making love to others, because when we can access these 
these subtleties of sensation and emotion in ourselves and like develop a relationship with them, it's easier to connect with them and others as well and, and allow people to connect with those in us. Um, so, you know, and that being said, you know, there are, you know, even having that sort of awareness and, and experience, like there's a lot of emotional psychological complexity when you come together with another person in any way, but especially at the depth of sexuality. Um, and we, sadly, I think that's, that's one of the things we miss is the opportunity for all of that, um, the, the depth of relating because we are sort of in this, you know, mental place with sex. And again, sort of missing out on, often missing out on all of the, um, the whole range of experience that's there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we so I just want to make that point here that this is not just about getting to pleasure. This is about making love to ourselves. So if whatever we're experiencing, allowing that to be there and making love to that as well, like, and that could be our sadness or our pain or. Absolutely. Yeah. And that actually, you know, this is a little bit more of an esoteric part of this, but it's something that um, through this practice, I did myself learn a lot about polarity, what we can call sexual polarity, the sort of, you know, dynamic between the masculine and the feminine. And, you know, this can get very abstract and there's, you know, whole books have been written on these topics and, um, <clears throat> but, you know, there is, I, I kind of see it in, in a number of ways where like, in a way, you know, the masculine is, is kind of creating this structure and having, creating a space for experience, for the feminine experience, for all that movement to happen. And so that's a way, whether you are male or female or more masculine or feminine, this practice gives you a way of directly experiencing both sides of it at the same time in a, in a way that you can actually be, again, because there's no distraction of another person, you can actually be conscious of your, your giving and your receiving, your space holding and your movement, you know, so you actually have direct access to both of these things at the same time. So, you know, and also, you know, I, I think most of us tend toward a more masculine sexual expression or more feminine sexual expression, but it's, and, and that's fine, but it's great to know both sides at least at least to know both sides, if not to be able to move fluidly between giving and receiving, um, between being more active or passive. Um, yeah, so that's just another beautiful aspect of this practice. I love that. Mm. Wow. Ah, oh, let's take a deep breath in and just like tune in just a minute with ourselves. Ah. Hmm. So what would you say for people, because we have a lot of people who are quarantined by themselves right now, like a lot of people. Um, mm. Can you speak to those people for a moment? First of all, I love you and I've been thinking about you and yeah, just feeling, I mean, the, 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 the need for human contact is, is real, you know? And um, yeah, I mean, for I just really want to say, like, I feel you. You know, if you're if you're if you haven't been touched in a while, um, and uh, this is a great great thing to do for yourself right now because like, again, you know, one of the things I learned from this is that we can touch ourselves like intentionally touch and receive touch and physical love from ourselves. And it is nourishing. It actually can be more nourishing even than being touched by another person. Um, and I get the importance of touch, but again, we actually, it's sort of interesting. It's like, I, I personally think that, I mean, there's a whole sort of developmental perspective to look at here. And of course we know babies will die if they're not touched and their immune systems won't develop properly and all, all of this. But as we grow into adults, we ideally are becoming more self-sufficient. That doesn't mean we don't need connection emotionally and physically. We, I think we do, 
Well, need, need is honestly a strong word. And this may be controversial to some people because we are kind of, you know, conditioned to think we need, need contact and touch. Um, it depends on where you're at and what your own orientation is. I mean, some people are hermits. Like I spend a lot of fucking time alone um, and I have throughout my life and I've, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, and I also love physical connection, but the point is here, you know, no, however you're personally oriented around that, you can touch yourself, you can nourish yourself physically and emotionally, give that to yourself. And I actually think that enriches your ability to both give and receive those things with other people. Um, so it's a perfect opportunity to do that. It's a perfect opportunity to, to learn, to directly experience that level of connection with yourself. Mm. And, and I, I also have to say here too, I mean, we're talking about this as you know, self-love making, and how that kind of transfers, you know, the, the awareness and skills within that transfer to making love with someone else. Awesome. Um, and, oh shit, I just got distracted and lost my point. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, that, that's what I wanted to say is that, you know, I've had amazing, beautiful experiences making love with my partner uh, and with other partners in the past you know, that can't be discounted. It's there, there's something that can be experienced there that you won't experience with yourself. However, the depth of pleasure and emotional richness that I've experienced in this practice is in some ways equivalent to what I have experienced with other people. And again, it's, I think it's fundamental to have that connection with ourselves. Yeah, it's going to make when the quarantine's over and you go and find your your lover, your sex is going to be much better if you're practicing self-love. Absolutely. And also, I just want to point to the, the psychological aspect of it, too, where, you know, I was talking about sort of as we move into adulthood, we become more self-sufficient, ideally. Um, and there's a way that you know if if we think we can only get love and connection and touch from others we're going to be probably grasping for it and in some way desperate for it if we don't have it yeah and you know that that's not attractive <laughs> and it's not a it's not sexy it's not a good way to um it's not an ideal way to approach connection um, and so if we're resourced in ourselves, our cup, our own cup is self-fulfilled, then we have so much more to give and we don't need, it's like, yes, it's great to receive. It's, it's wonderful. And it's actually hard for a lot of people to receive, which is another thing this practice can teach because you're learning to receive from yourself. But when you, you know, don't need that connection because you are connected with yourself, then your connections are going to be way better. Beautiful. And can you just speak a little bit about um, how it helps you to receive from others? Like, how does that? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, again, I think it goes back to the, you know, the, the fact that when you're doing this practice, you are both giving and receiving. Mm. And so, you know, a lot of people, again, like, people tend to be more givers or more receivers. I think very few people are just sort of equally balanced between the two sides and that's okay. You know, we can have a tendency and uh, there's no real problem with that, but people who tend to be givers tend to have a harder time receiving. And there's a lot to that. I actually have been like this and had to explore it. Um, and there's actually kind of a control aspect to that because it's vulnerable to receive. It's vulnerable. Um, we, we have, in a way, it's surrender, you know, surrendering to being receptive. Um, and there's no should in this. Sometimes it's not safe to surrender. Um, you know, boundaries are good. But, you know, when there's safety, which we can experience with ourselves, that's another beautiful thing. Let's, let's make a note to come back to safety and shame and trauma. Got okay? it. We're gonna do that. Um, but so, you know, when you're doing this, again, you are, you're actively experiencing giving to yourself and receiving. 
And there's that space, you have this space to experience, what does it feel like to be touched without the pressure of, uh, you know, any, any of the psychological pressures that come along with interacting with another person in this vulnerable way. So I, I hope that kind of covers it. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, I'm excited now to yeah. hear about trauma because sexual trauma is a thing. So it's a big thing. Yeah. So let's the, talk about how this can actually heal, like creating that safety and how we can heal trauma through this practice. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a big thing. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on trauma. I've certainly had my own traumas, including sexual traumas, which I've, I've worked on um, healing quite a lot. Um, but yeah, let's just see what we can get to and um, what comes up for me around this is one going back to that safety. You know, so if you have, well, uh, and I want to step it back just a, a, a second more, just say that even without direct sexual trauma, like someone physically violating us or threatening to violate us, even is traumatic, that I think the, the culture of shame around sex is itself traumatic. Absolutely. For We're all of us. Sexually traumatized, even if we've never been violated directly. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so there's that in a way we're all kind of dealing. I, I mean, personally, I think we live in a traumatic culture. We're traumatized in so many ways, including just around touch that isn't sexual. I mean, it's a huge, huge topic to unpack, but, um, so, but then let's bring in, you know, having, having directly been sexually violated, um, that kind of, you know, that can create a, a scenario where, or I think it generally does create a, a scenario where when someone, when you come into sexual engagement, there is a remembered threat in the body, you know, of like that this isn't safe. And so some people may sort of just run away from that and sort of avoid what may be unsafe situations, but other people just cut themselves off from feeling, you know, and maybe they're looking for love through sex, but they're not going to feel anything physically or, you know, emotionally, or, you know, we, we all may deal with these things in different ways, but there's a general unsafety that is created by trauma. And so I do think that this practice can give you a safe experience of sex where it's, it's completely safe. You know, no one, uh, you're not going to hurt yourself, right? I trust you not to hurt yourself you know, and I, I hope you do too. Um, but it, it, I think it can help to sort of repattern the experience of pleasure where, you know, and an another thing that I think happens with sexual trauma in particular is again, there's that sort of dissociation that can happen being cut off from feeling even sensation. Um, and, uh, this is a also, so this is, we're seeing this as a meditation. So if you notice your mind disassociating, you come back. Very, yeah, yeah, excellent point. And, um, and even, you know, I mean, as with any meditation, it's like our minds are busy and, you know, some shit comes up that happened on Facebook earlier today or, you know, whatever, like it's okay. the thoughts will come in. What's that? It's okay. It's, it's okay. Yeah, exactly. It's okay. I mean, it's, that's always going to happen. And so it's just a, you know, coming back to presence. Oh, I noticed that happened. Great. And in this, in this case, in this meditation, you're coming back to sensation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, there's so much around trauma, the dissociation from our emotions, from sensation. And so this is a way to, in a very safe way, to reintegrate the parts that have been cut off to reintegrate the ability to feel both sensation and emotion. Mm. Um, and I also think that it's, it's a, I do think that there's a tendency and people respond to, to various traumas in different ways, but I do think there's a tendency for a lot of people who have been traumatized to, con to keep s s ending up in situations where they're violated. And this is not in any way a blame thing. I think it's a conditioning thing. It's a patterning thing. And basically allowing their own boundaries, their own needs and desires to be overridden because that's what they were basically taught to do, 
in some way. And, and I think through violation, we often learn my desires don't matter, you know, and, and my, my pleasure doesn't matter. Um, and yeah, it, it's a complex territory again, but um, I do think that this is a way also that we get in touch with what actually does feel good to us, you know? And so we're aware of like, oh, that, like if we end up in a situation with someone where something doesn't feel good, it's more noticeable because we actually know what we want to feel. Yes. Right? And so then there's a, and again, it's through self-love as well, you know, experiencing that, like I'm worthy, I'm worthy of pleasure. Mm. Um, you know, and so that I just think can be, can be strengthening in that way that we become less susceptible to being violated and, and having our desires overridden. And I wanted to just talk about sexual shame and body image and how many people, even the most gorgeous people with gorgeous bodies, healthy, everything is just like, there is just so much shame around our bodies. Absolutely. And, um, and so taking this time to love your body and accept your body and work through all of those places. Cause if you're going into sexual experiences with someone else feeling that your body's disgusting and all of this shame, it's so, it just eats away any pleasure and fun and joy and happiness and yum. And Shut so we're taking the time to work through that with yourself and like loving your body. And of course, like doing what it takes to have a healthy body for sure. And spending the time through this practice, loving and accepting all parts of your body. Absolutely, yeah, it's a great point. And um, I do think, I mean, there's so, so much conditioning and you know, traditionally it's been more for women, like this is how you should look. And of course, if you look over decades, it's, it's, it has changed. You know, there's no absolute like way you should look, but currently, there's always, you know, a, a sort of preferred body image that is sort of pushed on you. But this actually happens for men now too, throughout my lifetime. You know, there's, there are all these men's magazines, even just, um, you know, in the eighties with the advent of steroids, it's like this whole, like, this is what a man should look like. So it's now everybody, what's that? And cock size. Cock yeah. size too, with, especially with porn. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're all have kind of bombarded with these images of what we should look like. And then maybe someone made a comment at some point that hurt us. And, you know, one little comment can get in there and create this whole complex of, of shame and, you know, wrongness in ourselves. Um, so that's a lot to, to deal with for anybody. And I think most of us are dealing with that in some way, like you said, Shaza. Um, but one of the interesting things you can see in this practice and a, a different perspective to take is that, you know, no matter what my body looks like, whatever form, you know, shape it takes, um, and whether it's what I want it to look like or not, the body is still a vehicle for, for pleasure. Um, it's a vehicle for a lot of things, you know, for consciousness and whatever we're doing in the world, but... I mean, these bodies are pleasure vehicles, ple pleasure vehicles. And it's and pleasure, it, pleasure spaceships, <laughs> pleasure spaceships. Nice. Nice. I won't mind the fly eventually. <laughs> I'm working on that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah, just the skin. I mean, just to appreciate your own skin. Um, this may, you know, this is a little, little sidetrack here, but I, it's one of the things that I've, you know, that when I learned about it really struck me is that the, the skin, first of all, is the only sensory organ. It is a sensory organ that covers your entire body. Your whole body is a, a, um, uh, an instrument for, you know, physical sensation for tactile sensation. And it's the largest organ in the body. It's the largest organ in the body, right. And, and every single part of that organ is capable of pleasure. So it's freaking awesome. 
it's a, it's a great thing to explore. It's always there, you know? That's right. Yes. Here it is. It's, re it's ready for you. So whether you are by yourself or not by yourself, I really, really want everyone to uh, explore this practice of sexual self-love or self-love making. And I would love for people to write or write something about it. I mean, this, what we're creating in this summit is for people to express themselves. This is a safe place um, for people to be vulnerable and real. So I would love to see people talking about their experiences of this practice. And I know Aaron has some deeper information that he's going to put in the link under the video so that you can watch more. And yeah, I, I love this. I feel inspired. And I feel like this is just a practice that everyone needs, particularly right now. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. I mean, always I, the reason I, I brought forth this particular practice is because to me, it's like, if there's one thing you do for yourself to improve your own experience of your body, your sexuality, um, your mind, your, yeah, and, and you're just your experience with loving yourself. I mean, this covers so many bases. To me, it's so fundamental. And I also just want to throw in there one thing, which so thanks for mentioning, I'm, I'm going to post an article which I wrote for men. Um, to you know, encourage men and give some guidance around exploring this practice. Um, but one cool, other cool thing that we just didn't mention is that if you are interested, especially as a man, but it's it's equally valid and, and um, helpful for women. But if you are interested in um, learning to have multiple orgasms for men, non ejaculatory orgasms to be able to consciously move your sexual energy through your body. Uh, this practice is essential to that. And I think and a lot of men, when they try to, that what's that? Here. We're going to go into a lot of that as well over the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Good, good. All right. Morning practice. <laughs> then, then I'll leave it there. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. I mean, to me, it's like a self-love practice with the, the tantric tools. Yeah. And the Dallas tools, golden. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for being here. I love you so much. I love and you too. You're amazing. And please, everyone, connect with Aaron. He's here on Facebook. I know that he wants to hear about how your experience went. And yeah, let's just love this guy up. Mwah. And yeah, sending you all love and um, signing off. Love you all. Thank you. Enjoy.